pleasure to be back. And um, uh, you've asked me to speak some background for this session you put together tonight. And uh, so those of you who, you know, will be there. Um, a little background on the creation evolution teaching controversy in America. Now this controversy over creation evolution um, is primarily fought over what is taught in United States high school biology classes. That's why I put this old picture up from the 20s. And notice this is an anti-evolution group. I mean, they sort of put your first clue. Um, but what is their book? It isn't hell in the agricultural research lab um, where they're using evolution or um, you know, hell at the Smithsonian where they're presenting evolution or hell at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. It's hell in the high school. That's where the controversy was then and has ever been. Virtually no one disputes teaching the theory of evolution in public colleges and universities or using public funds to support evolutionary research in agriculture or medicine. I've served continuously on NIH panels for the last 15 years and I have never seen an application at the NIH that used any sort of intelligent design or creationist concept for developing their um, for developing medical research. It all comes from an evolutionary viewpoint. There's no serious debate over the core evolutionary concepts of common descent among biologists. It's the mind of American high school students that are at stake. And the opponents of evolutionary teaching typically ask for one of three things. And that's what I tried to do for this talk, to try to, and that's what a historian tries to do, sort of to try to bring, there's a whole bunch of facts out there, and to become sort of organizational structure. And pardon me if I, you know, I'm a little simplistic in this, but it's try to put a sort of an organizational framework as a historian over a lots of discrete facts. And I say that there's sort of, if you take all the different things that people have fought for, on limiting evolutionary teaching or opposing intellectual evolution in high schools. It's three issues that you can group them in for the sake of simplicity. One, calling for removing evolution from the classroom altogether, just taking it out. Another would be balancing evolutionary teaching with some form of creationist instruction. Or three, teaching it in some fashion as just a theory. And those are sort of three. You can clump everything into those three categories. At least I will try to do that. Um, now, what's convenient is actually these three strategies, while always present, while they're present today, while they're present in the 20s, all three, you can discern them, people talking about all three. They actually do sort of play out chronologically into which is predominant. So you can put together as a historian three phases of the anti-evolution controversy in the order that I told them. And so what I'll do is I'll go through these displays in order, spending a fair amount of time on the first one, introducing the second one, and then as a way to focus in on what's happening today. Well, as I said, first then comes the phase of anti-evolutionism characterized mainly by efforts to remove evolution from the high schools altogether. Um, now, this was highlighted, of course, by the 1925 trial of John Scopes in Dayton, Tennessee. Um, Importantly, since this was sort of focused on the 20s, importantly, this effort coincided with and arose out of the so-called fundamentalist crisis in American Protestantism, when many mainline Protestant denominations, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the American Baptists, and others, were deeply divided between the so-called, what they call back then, the modernists, who adapted their traditional beliefs to current scientific thinking, and a new breed of fundamentalists who clung ever tighter to biblical literalism in the face of new ideas. No idea split the modernists from, from the fundamentalists more than the Darwinian theory of human evolution, captured, I guess, just for lack of a better picture, in this famous image from T.H. Huxley um, that um, would set the fundamentalist blood boiling. Um, but the rift caused by the idea of evolutionary teaching was aggravated by the seeming rise of agnosticism within the cultural and scientific elite. From the first, the fundamentalist modern controversy raged over the interpretation of Genesis in the pulpit. By that I mean people were concerned about what was being taught in the church, in the Sunday school, in the seminaries, or right from the pulpit. Was Genesis account being taught as allegorical, typological, metaphorical, 
or was it being taught as literally true? And that was an issue that you can trace back into the 1880s at least. Um, by the 1920s, both sides had carried that theological dispute into the classroom. Neither side wanted the others taught as fact in public school biology courses. In 1922, fundamentalists across the land began lobbying for laws against teaching the Darwinian theory of human evolution in public schools, leading to the passage of the first such statute in Tennessee during the spring of 1925. In that way, it's a, lot, it's a little bit like the current debate over intelligent design, where today something happening in a little school district in Pennsylvania, Dover, a tiny little town in in Pennsylvania, or with the Ohio School Board here in Columbus, or in the state of Kansas, makes national news. Front page news in the New York Times. Why? Because it's part of a larger movement. It's not due to something that's just happening in Kansas or in Dover. And it was the same way back then. When Tennessee passed its law, it was front page news around the country, not because some little state in the South that people really didn't care about in the North back then, um, did something, but rather because this was part of a national movement, a national issue. This issue had been cropping up all over the country, including in Ohio. Ohio school districts back then had passed restrictions on the teaching of evolutionary teaching. States around the country had passed. Brian had been speaking around the country in different lecture halls and, and in state legislatures in 22 different states. It just happened that Tennessee was the first time. In fact, some states had passed lesser restrictions. Tennessee was the first time they got a clean victory. This was part of, since it was part of a national move, movement, it was national news from San Francisco to Miami to New York to Boston to wherever. From the outset, the so-called anti-evolution crusade was, was seen as evidence of new and profound cleavage between traditional values and modernity. Now here, as a lawyer, I use the term evidence like a lawyer. The anti-evolution crusade, in my opinion, did not cause the cleavage. It simply exposed it that way. It's evidence of something else as opposed to a causal thing. Go back a generation or two before the 1920s, and Americans tended to share common values, or at least those Americans of Protestant European roots that set the tone for America back then. Oh, there were atheists, agnostics, and deists in mid-19th century America. But compared to today, they were, mar or compared to the 1700s, they were marginal. And theological disputes among Christians rarely disrupted denominational harmony. Even the academy was a conventionally religious place. That is until the rise of positivism, biblical higher criticism, and Darwinism late in the 19th century. By the early 20th century, surveys and studies began detecting a widening gap between the God-fearing American majority and the disbelieving cultural elite. I could give a variety of different evidence of that, but I'll just pick on commentator Walt Walter Lippmann, who was a very pop popular and influential elite commentator of the period, and he said, it was not that the elite wanted to reject God or biblical revelation, it was rather that the ascendancy of rationalistic, naturalistic modes of analysis made them unbelievable. Indeed, uh, let me add, it was the scientific method as applied to all facets of life more than any particular scientific inquiry um, that lay at the heart of modernity. But Darwinism was critical in applying that method to the two key issues of biological origins and human morality. Well, the Tennessee anti-evolution statute thus struck a chord that resonated widely. That attention garnered by the passage of that law soon focused on Dayton, Tennessee, when a local science teacher named John Scopes, and here is his picture, looking like Harold Lloyd, um, accepted the invitation of the ACLU to challenge that law in court. The media promptly proclaimed it as, quote, the trial of the century before it even began, as this young teacher, backed by the nation's scientific, educational, and cultural establishment, 
It wasn't an obscure event. On his advisory board was the president of Harvard University, the president of University of Michigan, or I guess I should say the school up north. Let me rephrase that. I shouldn't use that name here, especially two weeks before the cataclysmic conflict. Uh, the president of the University of Chicago. Um, you can just rattle through who was the president of Stanford, who was on the advisory board for the Scopes litigation team. Um, the president of the American Museum of Natural History. Um, that this group, this huge group, stood against the forces of fundamentalist religious lawmaking. For many Americans at the time and ever after, the Scopes trial represented the inevitable conflict between newfangled scientific thought and old-fashioned scientific uh, supernatural belief. Like so many archetypical American events, the trial itself began as a publicity stunt. Here's a scene from the day in one of the local newspapers. Inspired by the ACLU's offer to defend any Tennessee school teacher willing to defend the new anti-evolution statute in court, Dayton civic leaders saw a chance to gain attention for their struggling young community by hosting a test case of the law. We can see how it was reported in the papers right then, and I'm hawking papers. Um, it was captured by that famous journalist of the time, H.L. Mencken, one of the most popular journalists of the day, and a commentator. He's more of a commentator by then. He's, he wrote at the time, said, this is referring to the ACLU offer to, have to pay for and stage a test case. The town boomers accepted as one man. Here was an unexampled, almost a miraculous chance to get Dayton upon the front pages, to make it talked about, to put it on the map. Scopes became their willing defendant at the invitation of school officials. The young teacher was neither jailed nor ostracized, um, and indeed the statute didn't even carry a, uh, a, a possibility of a, going to jail was the penalty. Um, he spent most of his time, actually, from the time he was indicted to the trial, he went on a national speaking tour for the ACLU. He met with the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court came out and visited him. You know, he met in the top of the building. He went to the American Museum of Natural History, of course, in New York, uh, in New York City, which was then Evolution Central. Um, uh, he traveled around meeting with reporters, going to events. Um, this, was, this, was hard, this was not your scene of Inherit the Wind, where he's sitting there in jail. No, he's sitting, he's traveling all over. He came through Ohio, came through Columbus, actually, during that campaign, stunt, during that campaign trip, crunking up attention for this event. Well, as it played out, though, though originally the Dayton's civic leaders had this idea, the c people who concocted the law were actually the, the trial were against the statute. They were opponents of the statute and wanting to have a test case in their little town of East Tennessee. Um, but you know, it was too good a story for the reporters to pass up. The town indicting one of its own. Forget the fact that he was a volunteer. Forget the fact that he'd never taught evolution in his life. He wasn't a biology teacher. Forget all these facts. It was too good a story of this town attacking this individual. So that's the way the reporters covered it. And therefore, the actual the event sort of backfired in the poor town. Um, it was just too good a story to pass up. The real story, however, the one I will focus on today in putting these stages together, um, is that Tennessee had indeed passed its anti-evolution statute in the first place. And this, this issue had long roots. Ever since Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution in 1859, and here is a picture of, oh, there's Scopes thing that, here's a picture of Charles Darwin when he still had hair, an early picture of him, um, and before he had a beard to c compensate for the fact that he didn't have any hair. Um, ever since he published it, some in 1859, some conservative Christians objected to the atheistic implications of the theory, naturalistic explanation for the origins of species, particularly, and this was always the big issue, particularly naturalistic origins for humans. Further, some traditional scientists, and I had to bring in something about Harvard for Owen Gingrich here, um, Ace, um, Louis Agassiz, some traditional scientists, most notably the great Harvard zoologist Louis Agassiz, promptly challenged the very notion of biological evolution by arguing that highly complex individual organs, such as the eye, the example he used, and ecologically dependent species, he made a lot of this, such as you know, bees and flowers, could not evolve through the sort of minute random steps envisioned by Darwinism. 
Although the scientific community largely and very quickly converted to the new theory due to its ability to explain other natural phenomena that appear utterly senseless under the theory of design or of creation, such as the fossil record, the geolog geographical distribution of animals, the morphological similarities of animals, um, all these other factors that people made, that made sense under the theory of evolution, religious, uh, and in fact, one of the classic examples of that would come out of Yale, um, the, uh, and in the American Museum of Natural History. The, um, the evidence was very persuasive back at that time to bring people over. The evolution of the horse, finding the horse fossils out in the American West, showing the evolution of the horse from your typical five-digited um, mammal um, to the one hoof, one hoof toe and uh, showing that sort of evolution in the fossil record, which was, which was one of the big evidences, certainly the most influential evidence coming from America. Despite all that and the conversion of the religious community, uh, relig the scientific community, religious opposition to the theory of evolution remained. With these religious opponents often invoking the earlier scientific arguments against evolution. These religious objections naturally intensified with the spread of fundamentalism during the early 20th century. So even back then, the issue was intelligent design because the issue that Agassiz brought up were arguments of the same sort that intelligent design uses, that these things could not have come around by the minute random steps. Um, Darwinism couldn't, could, it couldn't work that way. Well, the legendary American politician and orator with deep well, Columbus Roots, because his sister was, his, his daughter, one of his two beloved daughters, was living here in Columbus at the time, and he often came up to Columbus. Here he is, William Jennings Bryan. Indeed, he was invited to participate to, in the Scopes trial when he was speaking in Columbus, Ohio. He was here in Columbus, Ohio, um, speaking at the national meeting of the Presbyterian Church um, when the invitation came for him to go to Dayton. So, another, another Ohio tie to this whole issue. Um, he added his voice to the core anti-evolution chorus during the 20s as he came to see Darwinian survival of the fittest thinking, which is known as social Darwinism when it's applied to human society. When he began to see that sort of thinking, social Darwinism, behind World War I materialism, ma mil militarism, excuse me, and post-war materialism. Both right. Of course, Bryan also held religious objections to Darwinism, and he invoked Agassiz's scientific arguments against it as well, that is, the intelligent design arguments. But his fervor on the issue arose from his social concerns. Equate humans with animals as the product of purely natural processes, Bryan reasoned, and, to quote him, they'll act like apes. And that's what he was worried about. With his progressive political instincts of seeking legislative solutions to social problems, Bryan campaigned for restrictions against teaching the Darwinian theory of human evolution in public schools, leading directly to the passage of Tennessee's anti-evolution statute in 1925. He had been there in Nashville speaking to the joint, legis joint session of the legislature, pushing the adoption of this view. Then, after it passed, and after this, mock trial was scheduled in Dayton over his statute by its opponents. He volunteered at the invitation, uh, the invitation he received here in Columbus, he volunteered to assist the prosecution um, for seeing the pending show trial as a platform because he knew it would get nation worldwide attention. He saw that as a pla and he was a natural orator and, and, and promoter. He saw it as a platform from which he could present his views. The whole world would be watching, the reporters would be there, and he could speak out about his concerns about evolutionary teaching. Well, the prospect of Brian using the trial to defend biblical religion and attack Darwinism drew in one of Ohio's most famous sons, Clarence Darrow, from Kinsman, Ohio a Buckeye. By the 20s, Darrow, and, and I should tell you, I have a new book coming out on Clarence Darrow in a short, very short while. I just looked at, got, saw the cover the other day. So, by Ohio, by Clarence Darrow. By the 1920s, Darrow unquestionably stood out as the most famous criminal defense attorney in America. His trials were sensational, with Darrow pioneering techniques of jury selection, cross-examination, 
uh, uh, witnesses and the closing argument to defend his typically notorious clients in bitterly hostile courts. Outside the courtroom, Darrell became even more famous by using his celebrity status earned in the courtroom and his oratorical skills to challenge traditional morality and religion. At the time, most Americans clung to biblical notions of right and wrong, with Darrow's clients, needless to say, quite wrong. Darrow, however, with his modern mind, saw nothing as really wrong or right. Everything was culturally or biologically determined. For him, dogmatic beliefs springing from revealed religion were usually the real culprit. By imposing narrow standards, by dividing Americans into sects, and making people judgmental. If you want to get a flavor for what Clarence Darrow was writing in the 19, 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, in popular books that were bestsellers in America, in short stories, in debates he held around America where thousands of people would come out, in the Chautauqua circuit where he was one of the top speakers in the chart circuit, all you need to do today is read Richard Dawkins because they say exactly the same thing. And they say it equally ably. They're both brilliant expositors of their point of view. And they're about equally popular. How Dawkins' book, Delusion, God Delusion, I think the latest one is, how that's selling and how his earlier books sold is about how, about the level that Clarence Darrow, the son of Ohio, had back then. But you know, if you don't, if you object to that, you have the salvation that he didn't go to Ohio State. He went to the school up north. See, that's where it leads. That's where it leads. Um, now, and you can take a couple of their speeches. Brian had a couple faint. Brian was a stump speaker, too, also. Very popular writer. Wrote books. Speaker on the chocolate circuit. Would go all over the country speaking on a whole variety of different issues. Um, Brian would typically give 200 speeches a year, and that's before airplanes. He's traveling around, going to different places to speak. Very popular lecturer. Um, and two of his famous speeches sort of capture the tone he took. I mean, he ta had political speeches, but he had one speech um, that, that was titled, God is Love, and another speech that was titled, Christ is the Prince of Peace. Dar Darwin, in contrast, damned religion is hateful, and Christianity is the cause of war. Indeed, Darrow saw rational science, particularly the theory of organic evolution, as offering a more humane perspective than any irrational religion. This left no ground for compromise between these two on this issue. Oh, both men were affable enough, and indeed they'd been political allies over the years, um, campaigning for each other, actually, and Brian, Darrow supporting Brian's various crusades um, for um, women's rights and for, um, against the World War I and, and uh, labor rights. But their fundamental worldviews were at war, and that's what came out in the Scopes trial. Well, the prospect of Brian and Darrow, two of the most popular orators in America, actually litigating the issues of revealed religion versus naturalistic science and academic freedom versus popular control over public education turned the trial, the Scopes trial, into a media sensation then and the stuff of legend thereafter. Here's a scene in the trial with a packed courtroom with Brian, of course. Um, it attracted hundreds of reporters to Dayton. It generated front page news, news stories around the world. It was broadcast live over the radio. You can see the microphone there. It was the first broadcast trial in American history. You could hear it in most of America, um, if you had the right radio. I mean, you didn't have, radios weren't very good back then, but to the extent you, you could, there it was, broadcast over the radio. Um, it became the subject, of course, over time of Broadway plays, Hollywood movies, and Nashville songs. Clearly, Scopes remains the best-known misdemeanor trial in American history. Despite Darrow's eloquent pleas for academic freedom and his humiliating cro cross-examination of Brian, and there is him in the courtroom, um, Scopes event ultimately lost the case, and Tennessee's anti-evolution statute was upheld. In large part, this happened not because of the merits of the case one way or the other, 
but from the simple fact that the United States Supreme Court had not yet extended the constitutional bar against government establishment of religion to public schools. That is, the fact that the Establishment Clause simply just didn't apply to public schools back in 1920. When the trial was all over, most neutral observers viewed the trial as a draw so far as public opinion is concerned. And that's a point worth remembering. We tend to see the Inherit the Wind version of the Scopes trial, or some of us do, and figure this was a slam dunk for Clarence Darrow. But William Jennings Bryan was an amazingly effective orator, and he used his time inside the, class, inside the courtroom and outside the courtroom to make his case. Um, and I looked over, in the course of my research, hundreds. Remember, this was front page news in every newspaper. So when the, for the verdict came down, every newspaper in the country wrote their lead editorial about what this trial means. And there wasn't a single editorial in the entire country that said this trial would be decisive. Just nobody, nobody thought the trial would be decisive. It didn't matter whether you were ridiculing Brian or ridiculing Darrow, nobody thought it was decisive. They all said, this is just going to get bigger, um, which it has. Um, and why? Well, America's adversarial legal system tends to drive parties apart rather than reconcile them. That certainly resulted in this case. Despite Brian stumbling on the witness stand, which is, you know, supporters could easily attribute to his notorious interrogator's wiles. I mean, who wouldn't look like a fool if they were being cross-examined as a hostile witness by Clarence Darrow? I certainly make a fool out of me. Um, both sides effectively communicated their message from Dayton. Maybe not well enough to win many converts, but at least well enough, at least ably enough to energize those already predisposed to their viewpoint and make them decide that this was a critical issue. Because when you think about it, why should this be a critical issue to so many people? Well, somebody's got to give it voice. There's some issues that would automatically rise to this level. And here, Brian and Darrow, we're doing it. If, as the defense claimed, more Americans became alert to the dangers of placing limits on teaching evolution, others, particularly evangelical Christians, became even more concerned about the spiritual and social implications of Darwinian instruction. Consequently, the pace of activism actually picked up after the trial. But it encountered popular resistance everywhere. Two other states and local communities all around the country soon followed Tennessee after the Scopes trial in outlawing the teaching of human evolution. But in other places, surprising resistance popped up. Minnesota was a surprising loss to that creationist when, when they, that legislature narrowly defeated anti-evolution legislation. And in Rhode Island, when one legislator introduced such a proposal in 1927, his bemused colleagues referred it to the Committee on Fish and Game, where it died without a hearing or a vote. A 40-year-long year standoff resulted in which a hodgepodge of state and local limits on teaching evolution, coupled with heightened parental concern elsewhere, led most high school biology textbooks and many individual teachers virtually to ignore the subject of organic origins voluntarily. As a result, after the same state Supreme Court in Tennessee reversed Scopes' conviction on a technicality, courts did not have another chance to review anti-evolution laws until the 1960s. By then, the legal landscape had changed dramatically. Remember what I said about the Establishment Clause. The change began in 1947, when the United States Supreme Court grafted the First Amendment bar against religious establishment to the liberties protected from state action by the 14th Amendment. Suddenly, the Establishment Clause took on new life. Whereas Congress had rarely made laws respecting the establishment of religion prior to 1947, so that there was virtually no case law on point, period, on the Establishment Clause, states and their local public schools had been doing so right along, with prayer in school and religious exercises in school and all sorts of things. Hence, with the change in 1947, there was a torrent of Establishment Clause litigation. Soon, scopes-like legal, legal battles over the place of religion in public education began erupting in communities across the land, giving the old trial new relevance everywhere. 
The first of these cases did not address restrictions on teaching evolution, but they surely implicated them. In succe successive decisions beginning in 1948, the United States Supreme Court struck down classroom religious instruction, school-sponsored prayer, mandatory Bible reading, and in 1968, therefore within my lifetime, scary enough, anti-evolution laws. These old laws simply banned the teaching of human evolution. Remember, that's what they were. They were out of the first phase of anti-evolution activity. They did not authorize, t authorize teaching other theories like creation science or intelligent design. Indeed, in his day, Brian never called for the inclusion of any form of creationist instruction in the science classroom because no other, no scientific alternative to evolution then existed. Even he believed that the biblical days of creation symbolized vast ages of geologic time, and he said as much so on the witness stand in Dayton. But then along comes these folks, most particularly this one over here, Henry Morris, um, a Virginia, who was a Virginia Tech engineering professor at that time, and with, um, together, published this book that you can sort of see here, The Genesis Flood, in 1961. And this book, The Genesis Flood, was one of a kind. There have been a lot of anti-evolution books, but there had never been a book like this. This book gave um, believers scientific-sounding arguments supporting the biblical account of a six-day creation within the past 10,000 years. This book sparked a movement um, within American fundamentalism with, Moses, with Morris as its Moses, leading the faithful to a promised land where science proved religion. The appearance of so-called creation science or scientific creationism, its proponents used both terms then and still do to an extent, launched the second phase of anti-evolution politics, the phase associated with seeking balanced treatment for creation science. Creation science spread through the conservative Protestant church through the missionary work of Morris's Institute for Creation Research. The emergence of the religious right carried into politics during the 1970s. Within two decades after the publication of the book The Genesis Flood, three states and dozens of local school districts, including Columbus, Ohio, had mandated balanced treatment for creation science along with evolution in public school science courses. It took another decade before the United States Supreme Court unraveled those balanced treatment mandates as unconstitutional. Creation science was nothing more than religion dressed up as science, the High Court decreed in 1987 in the decision called Edwards versus Aguillard. And therefore, as such, it was barred by the Establishment Clause from public school classrooms along with other forms of religious instruction. By this time, however, conservative Christians were deeply entrenched in lo local and state politics from California to Maine and deeply concerned about science education. Then along comes this man, um, University of California law professor Philip Johnson and the third phase of creation, the creation evolution controversy. Oh, a good friend of Owens, right? You know him pretty well, right? <laughs> debated. Yeah, you know him pretty well. Um, not recently, though, because he's not you know, feeling too well. But Johnson is, or at least then was, no young earth creationist like Henry Morris. He is, but he is an evangelical Protestant with an uncompromising faith in God. His target became both the philosophical belief and the methodological practice within science that material entities subject to physical laws account for everything in nature. Whether you call this naturalism, as sometimes the phrase is used, or materialism, another phrase that's often used for it by Johnson, such a philosophy and method excludes God from science laboratories and classroom. As Johnson once said, the important thing is not whether God created all at once as scientific creationism holds or in stages as progressive creationism or theistic evolution maintain. Anyone who thinks that the biological world is a product of pre-existing intelligence is a creationist in the most important sense of the word. By this broad definition, at least 80% of Americans, including me, are creationists. End quote. Darwinism may be the best naturalistic explanation for the origin of the species, Johnson stresses, but still be wrong. 
if public schools cannot teach creation science because it promotes the tenets of a particular religion, then scientific evidence of design in nature, or at least scientific dissent from evolution theory, should be permissible, Johnson argues. After all, evolution, as he says, is just a theory, and not a very good one at that. Now this is, we're talking about the third phase. Teach the controversy or teach that evolution is just a theory. Well, Johnson's books have sold over a half a million copies and it's no wonder that his kind of argument now shows up whenever objections are raised against teaching evolution in public schools. They were apparent in the United States Senate in 2001 when Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum offered legislation encouraging teachers, and I quote, to make distinctions between philosophical materialism and authentic science and to include unanswered questions and unsolved problems in their presentations of the origin of life and living things. Well, that language doesn't quite sound like your typical senator talks. It doesn't, because that exact language was written for him by Philip Johnson. He wrote the language. He supplied it. It went, it went to Rick Santorum, and he offered it. It appeared in a variation form in Ohio in the school guidelines here in a, in a, in a, in a um, sort of a lesson plan. Um, now, in this case, that language um, passed the Senate as an amendment to the No Child Left Behind education bill and eventually became part of the conference report for that legislation. Similar proposals, worded about like this, have surfaced as standalone bills in over a dozen state legislatures over the past what, about five years now? None of them have passed. But similar language has made it into state and local school guidelines around the country, most famously in Kansas and in Dover, Pennsylvania. Now, just to get, the, just to get all the pieces laid out before I qu quickly talk about those in the law, another, um, shelling somebody else's book here, another popular authority on this topic is Lehigh University biochemistry professor Michael Behe a devout Catholic who wrote his own best-selling book here, um, published by Free Press, um, challenging Darwinian explanations for complex organic processes, and most, most recently, he served, that is Michael Behe, served as the star witness for the defense in the challenge of the Dover School Guidelines. If Johnson is the modern movement's Brian, then Behe is his Agassiz reviving the arguments for design based on evidence of nature's irreducible complexity. Behe has never developed his arguments for intelligent design in peer-reviewed scientific articles. Indeed, he does not actually conduct any research in the field and, along with other leaders of the intelligent design movement, concede publicly, when pressed, that there is not yet much or virtually any affirmative scientific content to their so-called design revolution. Indeed, I was listening on the radio about a month ago and Johnson was being interviewed on NPR and he conceded that there, there is no scientific theory of intelligent design. Just, there isn't one. So far, ID theorists remain simply critics of the reigning paradigm in biology, doggedly poking holes and looking for gaps in evolution theory. Those gaps are best filled by, the de by design, they argue, or would be if science did not a priori rule out scientific explanations as out of bounds. And here we get a picture they provide of, I guess you'd call it an evolutionary tree of the creation lead intelligent design books, starting down there with Rich, uh, Johnson's Darwin on Trial and Behe's book, and then branching out. There's even more on this tree, but these are the key ones if you want to get your reading list down. Um, so the issue becomes, they're saying that the problem is that there are real problems with evolution theory, but their arguments are ruled out of bounds because they're not naturalistic explanations, and science by definition deals with naturalistic explanations or for scientific phenomena. So they propose, now propose, broadening the definition of science from dealing solely with naturalistic explanations for physical phenomena, which doesn't allow their ideas in, to, in, to a new definition of science that would include any account, and I'm quoting from now, that draws on physical observable data and logical inferences. 
At least they add design-based criticisms of evolution divorced from biblical creationism should be a fit subject for public school science education. With this approach, they have expanded the ten of people willing to challenge the alleged domin Darwinist dominance in the science classroom beyond those persuaded by Morris's evidence for a young earth. Yet, I need to add that every public opinion survey that I've seen and all the anecdotal data that I've collected suggest that the bedrock for anti-evolutionism in the United States is not the intelligent design movement. It remains the biblical literalism of the Protestant fundamentalist church, where there is typically greater concern about the age, about the earth's age to which the Bible speaks than about such intellectual abstractions as scientific naturalism. In the Genesis flood, for example, Henry Morris stresses, stresses the theological significance of utter fidelity to the entire biblical narrative. And not just in that book, but in a series of dozens of books and articles that he has written and his other ones that have been written by people at the Institute for Creation Research. Thus, when Genesis says that God created the universe in six days, he maintains, it must mean six 24-hour days. And when God says, and when it says that God created humans and all land animals on the sixth day, then dinosaurs must have lived alongside early man because all animals were created, land animals were created on the same day. So they had to live together. And when it gives a genealogy of Noah's descendants, well, believers can use it to date the flood at between five and 7,000 years ago. Now, a place you can see this graphically within an easy day trip that you could take your biology classes down to is right outside Cincinnati. They're creating, Answers in Genesis is creating a creation museum, which I got to visit as they were building. And I, it, I, it's nearing opening. So some of my pictures are show the, the hall, partly completed. But these are life-size uh, structures. And here you see Adam naming the animals, including saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths and things. Um, and this one wasn't, and these are life-size. And these, and one that wasn't quite done yet, but I took a picture of the artist's rendition. Here is two little um, cave people with some dinosaurs happily drinking out of the same, um, same pool of water. You can go see that as well. The, uh, looks like a scene right out of um, the Flintstones which shouldn't come as any surprise given the intellectual roots of the, of the Hanna-Barbera group. Um, despite judicial rulings against the incorporation of scientific creationism into the public school biology curriculum, public opinion surveys suggest that approximately four out of every 10 Americans accept biblical creationism of the sort espoused by Morris and his Institute for Creation Research. Now, if it's not propagated in the public schools, and I don't think it is, then creationism must, this sort of creationism, must be spread by other means. And conservative Christian religious organizations have the necessary structures in place. Fifty years after its initial publication, the Genesis Flood, by last count in its 42nd printing, continues to sell well in Christian bookstores. But it is now only one in a shelf full of such books. It was the first, but now if you go to a Christian bookstore, you'll see a whole shelf of Christian science books. Couple shelves of them. Christian radio and television blankets the nation with creationist broadcasts and cable casts, such as probably most influentially Kent Ham's Answers in Genesis. And here is Kent Ham with his dinosaur behind him um, down here near Cincinnati. He's moved to your area. He's originally from New Zealand, but now he lives here um, around outside Cincinnati. His broadcast, Answers in Genesis, uh, is now heard daily in over 750 radio stations in 49 states and 15 different countries, including, I looked it up, several stations right here in Columbus, so you can listen to it every day, or go on your webcast and catch it. Um, although still relatively low in absolute terms, the number of students receiving their primary and secondary education at home or in Christian academies has steadily risen over the past quarter century, with many such students learning their biology from creationist textbooks typically published by the Institute for Creation Research. 
At um, the post-secondary level, Bible institutes and Christian colleges continue to grow in number and size, with at least some of them offering degrees in biology and science education in creation-friendly environments. So, with a solid majority of people in some places believing in creation science, and an added percentage everywhere accepting intelligent design, teaching the theory of evolution inevitably becomes highly controversial in some places. Six years ago in Kansas, for example, creationists on the state school board temporarily succeeded in deleting the Big Bang and what they called macroevolution from the list of topics cover mandated for coverage in public school science classrooms. And here's a scene of the intelligent design crew with Michael Behe, sort of in the middle, a little bit to that side, um, testifying before the Kansas uh, school board. Last year, the Kansas school board took a, the further step of adding an intelligent, friendly definition of science to their state educational standards. That is, science is, as I told you before, evidence drawn from nature and not naturalistic explanations. In 2004, the Cobb County, Georgia School Board decreed that biology textbooks should carry a disclaimer stating that evolution was just a theory. Last year, the Dover, Pennsylvania School Board mandated not only an oral disclaimer akin to Cobb County's written one, but also recommended intelligent design as an alternative explanation for biological origins. In cases that made front page news across the country and overseas, federal district courts recently struck down the Cobb County and Dover restrictions. And so what I want to do in my few minutes left is quickly, since that's where the debate sort of stands and those decisions are important, let me just run over what was proposed in those states and what the court ruled. Uh, I promise it won't run too long and we'll have hopefully have plenty of time for questions. Responding to concerns of local parents and taxpayers, the Cobb County School Board had mandated that biology textbooks carried a disclaimer, a sticker, that said this, so you can follow along. This is what it said. This was put in front of every biology text, high school biology textbook. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origins of living things. This material should be appro uh, approached with an open mind, studied carefully and critically con concerned, considered. Um, similar disclaimers have appeared in Alabama textbooks for years without sparking lawsuits and are under consideration elsewhere. But perhaps because of the diverse nature of the county's population and its visible location as a bedroom community for Atlanta, the disclaimers immediately encountered stiff resistance in Cobb County. The Georgia American Civil Liberties Union, yes, there is one, uh, promptly filed suit on behalf of some local students and their parents. In his judicial opinion, Judge Clarence Cooper tackled the anti-evolutionist only a theory argument. Of course evolution is only a theory, Cooper said, but it's not a hunch or a guess. He wrote, the stickers target only evolution to be approached with an open mind, studied carefully and critically considered, without explaining why it is the only theory being so isolated as such, end quote. In light of the historic opposition to the theory of evolution by certain religious groups, Judge Cooper concluded that, and again I'm quoting, that an informed, reasonable observer would perceive the school board to be aligning itself with proponents of religious theories of origins. As such, he concluded, the, science, the sticker constituted an impermissible endorsement of religion under the prevailing constitutional standards. Well, let me get the other one out, and then we have plenty of time to discuss them. The Dover case, like the Cobb County one, involved school guidelines built on the ID argument that students should be told that evolution is a controversial, unproven theory. Let me get you up. Their, their statement is read orally, so it's actually quite a bit longer, but this is a very fair, I'm not biased at all, this is a very fair, I trust, summary. It's got three paragraphs. First paragraph within the talk sounds a lot like the Cobb County restrictions, and in it it says evolution is only a theory. In the second one, it expands on the Cobb County definition, but still goes into that part of the disclaimer, that there are gaps in the theories for which there is not evidence. Then it gets to its concluding paragraph. It adds, this is what makes it different than the Cobb County one, that intelligent design, notice it's capitalized. Intelligent design is an explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view. 
the reference book of Pandas and People is available for students who might be interested in gaining an understanding of what intelligent design actually involves. Well, now they're looking at this disclaimer, this oral disclaimer. Um, first, it deals with in parts. First, it looks at, okay, they mentioned this book, and it looks at this book. And when it looks at the book of Pandas and People, um, it concludes that this is a standard creationist text. It's not, it has, it has a whole variety of passages, including affirmations that basic kinds of living things, such as birds and fishes, were separately created for which there is only religious authority. They look into the history of the book and they see its roots go back to the old creation science movement, not just the new intelligent design movement. And they tie it to the old creation science movement and therefore there's established precedent that strikes it down. The Aguilar case by the Supreme Court had already said you can't teach creation science because that, only, that is a religious view and you can't teach religion as authority, as science in public schools. So that knocks out of pandas and people right at the outset um, as violating the constitutional bar against religious instruction. But then the decision goes further because that, if you really break it down, doesn't knock down this sentence that intelligent design, separate from the book Pandas and People, that intelligent design is an explanation of the origins of life that differs from Darwin's view. That, and that's where during a six-week trial, Judge John Jones in Pennsylvania um, went beyond the earlier decisions. He heard extensive testimony on intelligent design to determine whether it, devoid of whatever pandas and people said, whether it um, could be presented as an alternative explanation for origins in public school science classes. Here his decision broke new ground. Let me read some quotes from it. After a searching review of the record and applicable case law, we find that while ID arguments may be true, a proposition on which his court takes no position, ID is not science. He gave three reasons. First, unlike science, ID invokes supernatural explanations. Second, it rests on flawed arguments that evidence against the current theory of evolution automatically support the, this particular design alternative. And third, scientists have largely refuted the negative attacks on evolution leveled by design theorists. The judge stressed um, that ID has not been accepted by scientific community. It has not generated peer review publications, nor has it been subjected to testing and research. And every one of these points was confirmed on cross-examination on the witness stand by the lead expert for the school district, Michael Behe. He confirmed every point. He confirmed that no, the scientific community doesn't accept ID. No, there's no peer-reviewed publications on point. No, he conceded that there hasn't been subject to research and testing. I haven't done any. I can't come up with any possible tests you can even do. Indeed, so what was he to say? He comes back and he offers, he goes the way that intelligent design theorists who are very smart have been forced to do. He said, I just don't buy their definition of science. I don't buy the definition of science at the National Academy of Science and every scientific organization in Barth. I have another definition of science, the same definition of science that has been passed by the Kansas School Board. What is it, they ask him. Well, and quoting from the transcript, a proposed ex science is a proposed explanation which focuses or points to physical observable data and logical inferences. There it is. That's science. Some, a proposed explanation that focuses or points toward physical observable data and logical inferences. Well, once he conceded this, it was a field day. Because then the, the lawyers for the, to, seeking to overturn the statute says, hmm, well then what qualifies as science? Would astrology qualify? Yes, astrology would qualify according to Behe. Would the theory that the sun goes around the earth qualify? Yes, he said yes the Ptolemaic theory would qualify as science today. And you just keep adding and adding example after example 
they kept digging him deeper in a hole that, you know, astrology gets in as much as astronomy. This alone probably sealed the decision. In that sense, just like Brian and away at Dayton, Behe was his own worst enemy. But evidence that the school board members acted with clear religious purpose and then tried to cover their tracks by lying in court also turned this judge, Judge John Jones, who was a no-nonsense conservative appointed by George W. Bush and nominated by Rick Santorum for the job, it turned him against the school policy. He concluded his 57-page decision with the statement, the breathtaking inanity of the board's decision in adopting these guidelines is evident when considered against the factual backdrop that has now been fully revealed at this trial." End quote. Well, in Dover, as in Cobb County, the school board's decision to adopt the anti-evolution disclaimer polarized the community. It divided families neighbors and churches. In an election ha held before the school, before the court ruled, but after Behe had given his disastrous testimony, voters replaced the entire school board with candidates opposed to the policy, guaranteeing that there'll be no appeal of the court's ruling. When Americans on either side of this controversy watched what happened in Cobb County or in Dover, they know they are looking at a mirror and wonder how it might play out in their own hometown and among their friends and fellow Christians. Of course, the media took notice, making these cases top news stories of the year. That, in brief, is where the creation evolution teaching controversy stands today, still making news 80 years after Dayton, Tennessee, garnered headlines by prosecuting scopes. Indeed, it still lives in Dayton itself. If you go to Dayton, I'll give a plug. For, if you go to Dayton down in the summer, drive down during the exact same days that the trials took place, you can go down and see every night, or in the courtroom, a reenactment of the trial. Now, I, they had me up for the 75th, and that's why I had the 75th when I was there. But they still do it every year. You could go down this summer and see in a reenactment. You can buy little carved wooden monkeys. You can um, participate in the whole event. That's the way this story continues to live in its hometown and throughout. But it's not just in Dayton. It per periodically resurfaces in countless Daytons throughout the United States, where over everyday episodes of science teachers either defying or deifying Darwin. Such acts generate lawsuits and litigation precisely because religion continues to matter greatly in America. Public opinion surveys invariably find that nine in 10 Americans believe in God, just as they have found ever since surveys began polling on such matters in the 1950s. A recent survey indicated that over three-fourths of all Americans believe in miracles and that three out of five of us now say that religion is, quote, very important in our lives. It troubles many Americans that science does not affirm their faith and outrages some when their chi child's biology coursework seems to deny their biblical beliefs. As a diverse people, we have learned to seek middle ground wherever possible. As a species, however, we instinctively respond to stirring oratory. Darrow and Brian had mastered that craft and used it in Dayton to enlist their legions. They tapped into a cultural divide that deeply troubles this national house of ours, offering us no middle ground. And as we all know, either from the Bible or from a Broadway play, he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. That wind has been sporadically touching off mail storms over the past 80 years, storms that sorely test our tradition of tolerance. If history is any guide, dark clouds remain on the horizon. Thank you. Do you have some time left? Any questions? You brought me here, so you get the first question. I mean, they do to an extent notice that the um, in Kansas they also back five six years ago they banned the teaching. The, they also in the band, but they didn't. They st wouldn't test for the theory of the Big Bang either. 
Um, but this is my opinion of why, because you're absolutely right. It's the one that catches all the fire. And I'm using, um, going back to the battle as it has always been played out ever since the um, 1859 when Darwin's theory came out. And it's because of humans. Is it because it ties hum human evolution has always really been the issue. Now, it gets lost a little bit on Henry Morris talking about utter fidelity to the biblical narrative and the importance of the earth is 10,000 years old and, and, um, and Philip Johnson and the intelligent design crew talking about that each species has to be, um, each kind has to be, there can be mi microevolution, but each kind had to have been separately designed. Um, but I don't think that's why it catches fire. I think it's the idea of humans. And certainly that was the case with William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan himself believed that everything else probably evolved. He didn't have any problem with that. What bothered him was the thought that humans, um, and he had some scientific support. Um, there was a pretty famous physician at that time, physician scientist named Howard Kelly at Johns Hopkins University who backed Brian up on that point, that humans, that humans were different. But you go back earlier, you can go back in the time of uh, William Jennings, um, of, Clarence, of, of, of Charles Darwin himself, and you get, you get his supporters, some of his key supporters, like Charles Lyell and, um, and um, Alfred Russell Wallace, breaking with him on the evolution of humans, that humans were somehow separately created, either totally out of whole cloth, out of the dust of the earth, formed by God, or at least that there was an evolved human body and God imparted it with a soul or with a reasoning ability or with um, special characteristics that may turn, transformed it from an ape to a human. And the, it's the connecting of the humans that I think makes this the big issue that really resonates with a lot of people. It's what made D Brian's arguments sing and I think that that's what the other things, sure, the other things could raise concerns. But if you could peel off humans, you wouldn't have the controversy. If you could think everything else evolved, that humans were separately created, you wouldn't get the depth. There would certainly be, you could, you could make the same sort of general arguments. But I think it's the human issue. Um, I think it was then, and it is now. And, so I, and, and only the biology draws this distinction with humans. In fact, um, let me, if I can, if you give me a, I can go back, and I've got a cartoon that I think captures that, if I quickly go back. It's an old cartoon. Um, you'll have a tough time looking at it, but let me get back. I've got it somewhere. There it is. This was from, this was, this, I think this captures it, this is from Punch Magazine. It's English, but you can find the same thing in American. And it shows the sophistication and the interest. When Darwin's book was published, it sold out the first day. I mean, it wasn't like some obscure scientific text. And it was reviewed in all the major uh, newspapers. It was reserved in the London Times. It was, re you know, I mean, it wasn't just this science phenomena. It was reviewed in all the science journals. But it was reviewed next day, in the next couple days, in the, in the popular journals. And um, the same thing happened when Darwin published his, um, in 1871, published his Descent of Man, which is his other great book. I mean, he has lots of books. and. And certainly, Voyage of the Beagle, or Journal on Researchers, as it was then called, is a magnificent book and was a popular seller. But the other one that really shook the world, um, the intellectual world in Europe and in America, the much awaited one was Descent of Man. Now, you know, evolution, uh, the origin of species comes out and is generally accepted, but he dodges, he knows that the issue is going to be human. So he never talks, virtually never talks about human evolution in, in, um, in Origin of Species. He's trying to make his case for evolution in general. And it's Huxley that comes out, and remember I showed you his picture of those, Anna, of those the gibbon and the human. He writes a book about man's place in nature and puts and adds. And Darwin keeps quiet on that issue because he wants, he knows where the real battle's gonna come is human evolution. So he keeps quiet about it. But 10 years later, 12 years later, he comes out with Descent of, descent of Man. Um, where he talks about it. And so, as soon as it was published, I mean, look at the date, as soon as the book came out, there was this much popular resonance that Punch, you know, a popular magazine, could run a cartoon, a next day editorial cartoon about a science book, in which it has this, I'll have to read you this because it doesn't come quite out, but it, it, 
where it shows this typical scene that cap, I think it's a beautiful cartoon, that captures sort of the essence of, of America or England at that time, typical scene of the, you know, before TV, of the husband reading from a book to his wife and little girl, you know. And the book, of course, in the image would be the Bible, reading in front of the fireplace, or if not the Bible, at least Charles Dickens. At least he's reading the Pickwick Papers or something. But no, what he's actually reading to his family is the Scent of Man. <laughs> reading from the Scent of Man, trying to capture that image. And so he is reading, he's reading a concluding line, if you read it, it's a logical refutation of Mr. Darwin's theory. And he's writing, so you see, Mary, we're all descended from hairy quadrupeds with pointy ears and a tail. This is a family scene. And to which his wife replies, speak for yourself, Jack. I'm not descended of anything of the kind, and baby takes after me. <laughs> so I think, that, I think it's the human thing, and, and right from the day one, and I think it still is the human thing. And that's why the Catholic Church has largely avoided the issue, because early on, starting in the 1880s, 1890s, Zahn and Notre Dame, but also the things from Rome, we're suggesting, I mean, not that we believe in evolution, but we don't have problem with evolution as long as we keep the human soul as separate. It could be that God evolved, the hum, evolved from an ape, a hu, evolved ape, and then put the soul of man into it, and evolved human ape, and made, and it's, you know, in a way you could see that as captured in the Sistine Chapel ceiling with this body being made fully human. And not that they endorsed that view, but they, they always said it was acceptable. And that is the way I read Pope John Paul, the second statement back in, what was that, about 96 or something? I think his, his statement reads as a re-endorsement, a very important and careful, despite what the Archbishop of, of Vienna says, a very carefully articulated, very significantly written reaffirmation of that basic viewpoint. But we're drawing the line at humans, the human soul and morality um, is different. And that's where somebody like a Richard Dawkins um, offers the, conf the, 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 the battle, draws the battle lines, and where somebody like a Francis Schaeffer or a Francis Collins, excuse me, shouldn't equate the two, Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project from that school up north, and um, David Lack, the great, um, the great um, discoverer of Darwin's finches, the namer of Darwin's finches, where they would be on the other side, where they would, you know, peel off, you know, or standing, stand, standing, little scientists who who make the distinction by pulling off humans in the same way that the Catholic Church does. Other questions? I saw one back there, but the person might have already left. Yeah, I'll take you, but I think the person already walked out. Yes. Oh, good question. He's asking, um, um, not when I get very often, is the trial phenomena, that is, litigating this area in court, is this uniquely American? Usually I get the question, is the creation evolution controversy uniquely American? And to that answer, I say no. But is the trial, yes. Yes, I would say so. Because only we have an establishment clause. England doesn't have an establishment clause. So, I mean, the problem at the Scopes trial is, what could they argue? They lost in Scopes trial, and as, as well they should. I mean, there was nothing they could argue except to argue to the public that this is a dumb law. They couldn't argue it was unconstitutional because there was no separation of church and state. And you have that same problem. So, uh, um, it wasn't just in America that creation science statutes passed. Um, they passed in British Columbia, for example. They taught creation science along with the same time we passed them in this country. Queensland, Australia. Um, there was no litigation. There was no law you could bring against them. They were, in, in, at least in both cases, they were eventually pulled down by the legislature. They withdrew them when a new government took power. Um, so there haven't been this, these trials. It hasn't become a courtroom issue. In England right now, the state is funding creationist schools. Um, it's not an issue that you litigate. Um, uh, so, um, so yes, the, the trial phenomena, and I think the trial phenomena by its very nature adds to the dynamism of the issue. The dialectic, the dialectical dy uh, 
dynamism that back to this issue because courts you know like CNN it's pound, point counterpoint I mean you tend to be extreme viewpoints and uh, and that's what makes trials exciting and um, so they try to they they tend to tease out into extreme viewpoints the way they play out in court European court system doesn't even work that way Europeans don't even have that sort of adversarial system where both sides are what you'd have is you have courts are very different they play a much different role in society and judge and judges are more like like administrative law judges where they sit there and they bring all the parties together and they try to work out a compromise rather than have this big public display with both sides and then a disinterested body um, of, judge, of, of jurors trying to, to weigh these two one-sided presentations so you don't even have the structure of courts in other places to make it visible but then you don't have the legal the, the constitutional rules that come into play either so um, yeah I, it, it is a uniquely American phenomenon yeah right absolutely absolutely second phase absolutely absolutely that's why I put that in the second phase the second phase was mandating some sort of balanced treatment. They were a second phase decision, absolutely. That's why I tried to have the three phases. And that's why they're different from the, different from the current court cases. I, and, and the first phase, the issue was, which was finally struck down in the 68 decision of Epperson versus, was banning evolution. And so yes, absolutely. That's what potentially comes up in this current phase, but no Supreme Court decision is, because the other two, we have Supreme Court decisions, and that's why I peeled out these two phases. There are three phases, and it's the, it's the outlawing evolution that we have a Supreme Court decision and mandating um, balance treatment, absolutely. Well, what about at the state level? At the state level. Well, you have you have just the one I went through. You have they're not state level; they're d federal trial court level. Um, but you have the decision in in Cobb County, and you have the decision in in Pennsylvania, which which um, which deal with specific school guidelines. You know, they're not general. They deal with you take this specific guideline. They look at that guideline. And they conclude that those guidelines would violate the current interpretation of the Establishment Clause. That current interpretation being the test espoused by Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor, variously known as the endorsement test, if it's O'Connor's, or the proselytizing test, if it's Kennedy's. They're somewhat the same. It depends on how you interpret them. That interpretation of the Establishment Clause is that the Establishment Clause bars the government, including a local public school board, or a state board of education, or a state legislature, from doing something that leads a reasonable and prudent observer, that's the phrase a lawyer would use, to that observer would perceive not your hypersensitive observer, but your reasonable and prudent observer, if they saw this happen, that they would perceive that the government is taking sides endorsing a particular religious viewpoint. So this has led to the wonderful, um, if you're a lawyer, not if you're a citizen, but if you're a, if you're a lawyer, the wonderful panoply of decisions such as involving the Christmas displays at um, in December or the posting of the Ten Commandments. So, for example, when Kentucky, when a, a local court in Kentucky, county in Kentucky, posted all by itself, this was decisions issued last year, current Supreme Court, posted the Ten Commandments all by itself on a wall, but just in a nice little, tasteful little thing, you know, that was unconstitutional because the reasonable and prudent observer they concluded would come and see that nice little tasteful posting as 
endorsing the Ten Commandments to Jail Christian sort of captured in that version of the Protestant version of the Ten Commandments. Um, in contrast, the same day the Supreme Court upheld and said it was constitutional for Texas to have this massive granite monument on its state capitol building along with gobs of other massive granite monuments. One of these monuments was a huge monument to the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments put across them. But there are other statues of Stephen Austin and there are statues of this and there are statues of that and there are monuments to this and there are monuments to the war dead. And, and they said anybody who walks across this thing would see, well, here's a collection of monuments to different things. And they wouldn't observe that the state is picking out this in particular. They viewed that's what a reasonable observer. Same way, if, you, if a local community puts only a crutch at Christmas time in the courthouse square, that has been held to violate the Establishment Clause because people would say, oh, they're picking out the crutch. But in contrast, if in the courthouse square at Christmas time you put a menorah, you put a crutch, you put a talking wishing well, you put Santa, you put a Kwanzaa thing, whatever a Kwanzaa thing is, you put all these things up, well, people would say, they're, oh, they're celebrating the holidays. It's, what it, and it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a mushy test. It's a know-it-when-I-see-it test. And that's the test that's used. And so they, these courts have realized, you put a sticker in the front of a biology textbook that singles out evolution to study critically. It doesn't say study critically about all scientific ideas. Because if it said that, that'd probably be okay. Be critical about them all. But it only singles out evolution. Or you get the local, you mandate that the local teacher gets up there and stands there and reads a statement that singles out intelligent design as the only alternative named to evolution. Not all the other possible alternatives to the theory of evolution, but only that one, intelligent design, capital I, capital D that that is endorsing that viewpoint. So you're tied into that, you know, the one particular, but it doesn't say, none of them in my opinion says, that a school teacher couldn't include ideas from different sources and use in a pedagogically sound way some of the critiques and issues raised by the creation science or intelligent design movement as long as it didn't give the impression to a reasonable and prudent observer, which in this case would be a normal, seventh grader or a normal ninth grader or a normal twelfth grader, whatever grade you're teaching, because that's the observer, that that school district is endorsing this viewpoint. So that's how these cases have held, and that gives me a time, and, and it looks like you're shoving me out of here, so I'll stop.